one of the things that labor platforms always try to avoid is this distinction on whether they are an intermediary or they're actually an employer. And I want to share the few value framework, frameworks around this because uh, a lot of the boundaries of intermediary versus employer, employee versus contractor tend to be very fuzzy. So I want to share um, some value frameworks because not everything that we think of as a labor platform or the sharing economy platform is architected in the same way. Every platform is unique and different. And there are some that tend to be more intermediary and some that tend to be more of an employer. And I want to share a framework around that. The framework that I think of is fundamentally the following. The test of a true platform is that it enables free agency and it allows the ecosystem on it, the producers and consumers of value, to scale using the platform's tools and resources. If a platform instead appears to be controlling and exploiting its ecosystem, it's closer to a hierarchy and closer to an employer than to an intermediary. So one of the classic tests that I like to think about applying is, is the platform empowering or exploiting the worker? That can help us negotiate, reason out, and create a framework for discussion with the platform in terms of whether they should be regulated as an employer or as an intermediary. The reason this question comes up in the first place is because platforms have this unique um, dichotomy, this unique situation where they decentralize production. They open out the production, laborers from outside come in, workers from outside come in, but they centralize the rewards. They centralize the governance. And so a lot of the decisions around how workers should work, what workers are allowed to do, what they're not allowed to do is very centralized. The ownership of the platform itself is centralized, not just in terms of setting the rules, but also in terms of extracting the rewards. And because of this dichotomy, very often what happens is that what is good for the platform often tends to be bad for the ecosystem because the platform is very often focused on maximizing returns for itself without ensuring maximal returns for each and every worker. And those are the cases where platforms tend to exploit these workers. There's another important consideration over here, and that is the fact that the nature of work is the single most important determiner on whether the platform will empower or exploit the worker. The more commoditized the work is, the more the work can be treated as a commodity, the more the platform is likely to exploit the worker. The more differentiated the work is, the more it is in the interest of the platform to empower the worker so that the worker can show his differentiated skills and create more value on the platform. And we see this pattern coming up repeatedly. I just want to lay out this hypothesis before I start proving it with, a, with various mechanics of how platforms think about it, how platforms make decisions to implement it. But fundamentally, this is the key difference between platforms that work hierarchically, work like an employer versus those that work like an intermediary. The nature of work, the more commoditized it gets, the more beneficial it is from a business model perspective for the platform to control the worker. The other thing that uh, this leads to is that the more commodified the work becomes, the greater is the power imbalance between the platform and the worker. The more unique the skills are, the lesser is the power imbalance. Think of uh, uh, a top producer of video on YouTube, somebody who has a million or a couple of million followers on YouTube. YouTube as a platform cannot uh, exploit somebody like that because that, that person is creating a lot of value for YouTube. But think of a, of a driver on Uber. A ride on Uber is perfectly commoditized. It is so commoditized that as a consumer, we don't really care who's driving us. We just want a ride from point A to point B. And so the power imbalance between the platform and the worker is incredibly huge because of how commoditized the work is, because the worker is fully replaceable. So one of the first things that this leads us to is that if, we, as w if, if workers, from a worker perspective, if workers want to participate in the platform economy, the ideal situation would be to look for platforms that reward differentiation rather than platforms that commoditize you further. And this is something that we see repeatedly in the platform economy. There are only two kinds of winners. It's either the platform or the highly differentiated worker on the platform. Everybody else starts getting commoditized. 
The other thing this leads to is the more commodified the, the worker is, the more the power then balance between the customer and the worker as well. Because the worker is a commodity, and the platform really cares about ensuring that customers stay on. Since there's an abundance of workers, the platform doesn't care about throwing a few by the wayside, exploiting them in ways they don't want to be used, as long as the customer is happy. So what we end up seeing, and this is a uh, characteristic of all two-sided markets, one side is usually more valuable than the other. And in the case of uh, work platforms, the more differentiated your skill is, the more the worker is valuable. The more commoditized your skill is, the more the customer tends to be valuable. And if we just start with these two frameworks, we start seeing a lot of things emerge. Uh, we start seeing Uber very differently from freelancer.com or from uh, Upwork or Odesk. We start seeing Airbnb very different from um, Deliveroo or some, some of these other food delivery platforms because we, we rapidly see that in some of these cases, differentiation is encouraged, rewarded, and most of all is good for the business model. In other cases, commoditization is good for the business model. And as I mentioned, the more commoditization is good for the business model, the worse it is for the user himself. There are two other issues that are important over here. The first is the fact that certain kinds of work involve repeatability of exchange between the same two parties. So think of a, a freelancer platform where you're trying to find a freelancer. If, you find a, if you're looking for the designer and you find a good designer, you don't want to keep going back to the platform and find a new designer. And so in this case, the moment a good match is made, the power shifts to the worker. In the case of something like an Uber or a delivery platform, a food delivery platform, that never happens because there is no repeatability of exchange. There is no provision for a worker to build a relationship. And when there is no relationship being built on the platform, there is no leverage that the worker has over uh, the platform. So you can even see this in the way these platforms make their pricing decisions. If you look at Uber, there's a standard price for every transaction. If you look at a freelancing platform like Upwork, the pricing works in a way where the more I continue to work with a particular client, the less I have to pay the platform. So it starts falling, falling over time. Initially, it used to be a standard price, and then over time, they realized that because of the standard price, the best freelancer client relationships are leaving the platform because it's much easier for them in the long run to work outside the platform. So they changed their pricing in a big way with over time, as the freelancer and, work and uh, client keep working together, the pricing for the freelancer keeps going down, and there's a small amount of pricing that goes to the client because the client has now found somebody who's really good. And that's the way where the worker, the more there is a, a repeatability of exchange, the worker starts getting more power on the platform, which does not happen with a lot of commodified work. So repeatability of exchange is another thing that uh, we need to regularly look for in terms of this understanding this power imbalance. Associated with this is the idea of whether the platform allows a worker to develop influence, whether a platform allows a worker to have greater impact on the platform. And very tactically speaking, this essentially means, does the worker have an option to gain followers? Does the worker have an option to create a bigger brand on the platform? We see this happening on platforms that are related to intellectual work, especially uh, those related to uh, design, for example, uh, platforms like Behance, Dribbble. These are all platforms that allow you to create influence, gain reputation, gain greater visibility, and hence get exposed to more and better jobs on the platform. But we don't see this in commodified platforms again. So we keep coming back to this point that the more commoditized a platform, uh, 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 the nature of the work is, the more likely it is that the platform will work like an employer rather than like an intermediary, because it is in the best interest of the platform to control the worker to its advantage. Let's talk about control, because that is the central idea over here. When we think about taxes, issues around taxes, a lot of those things come back to the idea of, are you an employer? Are you an intermediary? Should you be responsible for what's happening? Uh, on, on your platform with your workers, or are you just uh, radiating all that responsibility to the workers? A good framework over here is to think about how does the platform exert soft control? It may not exert contractual control, but there are other forms in which a platform exerts control. 
One example of this is that a platform may control the terms of exchange. Let's take the example of Uber. The price is not set by the driver. The price is set by the platform. Contrast it with every other platform like Airbnb or Upwork, where the price is set by the worker for the specialized skill that they bring to the platform. Again, it's connected to commodity. The price gets set by the platform. That, again, takes free agency away from the worker because the worker cannot determine what the price is going to be. This gets compounded further when you think of food delivery platforms, especially when Uber Eats uh, was launched. The price was set by the platform, but as the platform learned more about how the market was behaving, it kept on changing the way the <coughs> price worked, from a standard cut to a fixed fee plus a small, a small transaction cut uh, to other kinds of uh, combinations they did on the pricing, which eventually optimizes the market but does not necessarily optimize for a worker's situation. Sometimes the price works in a way that it works for workers who are fully committed to the platform, but somebody who wants to just make two hours of uh, work on the site does not really get uh, enough benefit on the platform. So setting up the, the terms of exchange is another thing that makes a platform more like an employer. Even if we come back to the idea of Uber, the route uh, to a large extent is set by the platform. It's, uh, or, or there is uh, a guidance on what kind of route should be taken. So e even though a lot of these things seem like features on an application, from a work perspective, they are measures of soft control and removing free agency of the worker. The second thing that's important is that on, on a lot of these platforms, the algorithm is the middle manager. And the algorithm is a black box both to workers and regulators. So it's very difficult to determine exactly what is happening, whether there is a control of the worker, whether there is a removal of free agency away from the worker, what are the terms on which a worker can improve his exposure, his output on the platform. Again, the more commodified the skill is, the more this becomes a black box, because the platform is not really interested in you improving your skill. If the skill was differentiated, the platform would want to come back and keep telling you how to improve your skill so that you could keep uh, creating more value for the platform. So what we keep coming back to is that the, the interest of the worker and the platform are misaligned when the work is commoditized, and they are much more aligned when the work is differentiated. Another form of soft control that's important is the idea of metrics-based control. What this essentially means is that the platform does not tell the worker what to do, but the platform sets metrics that indirectly influence the worker. One such way of setting metrics is to put some form of peer benchmarking, which tells the worker, other workers today have performed in this way, you have not performed even half of this, you need to start matching up, or you, you might lose uh, a bonus on the platform. And that's one way in which metrics are shown to manipulate workers, which from that perspective is not too different from a hierarchy where again metrics are shown to encourage workers in specific directions. Metrics are also shown, uh, uh, metrics based control is also used to control the payout that workers get. If you um, hit a certain number of rides in a particular day, you get to take x, x percent, but if you go beyond that, you get to take 2x percent of that. And so that's a way of controlling the worker through metrics. So again, another thing to look for is, is the platform using metrics-based control? Is that something that could make it work more like a hierarchy? All of these things start adding up. Eventually what happens is that a lot of platforms end up working in a winner-take-all scenario, where, you, where the more workers work on a certain platform, the more customers want to come in that direction, and so on. Now, when we look at platforms today, they are constantly trying to get towards this model of how can I mon monopolize my control of the market. Now, if you think of Uber, the cost of switching is very low today. You, a driver can switch from one app to the other, a, a traveler can switch from one app to the other, which is largely why Uber has to burn so much money before it can even win, because it's really a game of last man standing. But during this process, Uber is trying to, to make small changes which help to increase control over the system. One such change is that in the past, you had to complete a ride before you could accept the next ride. Today what happens is that while your ride is going on, you can accept the next ride right away, <coughs> and you can immediately move to the next ride. And that happens because Uber realized that the time between a ride closing and the next ride starting is when the switching happens uh, 
particularly. And so they've now gone and, uh, and put the workers on a model where they're constantly moving from light to light. In itself, there's nothing exploitative about that feature. But when you combine it with all these other things, when there is no free agency and now you're uh, holding the, 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 the worker controlled to your platform, st stuck inside your platform, then you're exploiting him even, even further. And so when all these things start working together, then we see a much larger effect play out. The next issue is that very often platforms have much more information about the market, about the worker, than the worker themselves. And so platforms are able to manipulate on the basis of that because they are constantly surveying how the workers are behaving, what's, uh, what, what kind of uh, uh, clusters th these workers fall into. Certain workers behave in certain ways and so they are likely to exhibit certain behaviors in the future. So they start doing all of these analytics which an individual worker has no, uh, uh, no view of. And again, when you start combining this with all the other things that a platform does in terms of controlling the worker, this enhances the control because the negoti negotiating power, again, is much lower on the part of the worker. So that's the idea of control. Let's, let's talk about one other really important issue with platforms, and that is the way the reputation system is structured. Every platform has a reputation system. A reputation system, the easiest way to understand it is the rating system that you see on an Airbnb, an Uber, an Upwork, a Deliveroo. A rating system, a reputation system, its first goal is to differentiate the good from the bad so that the quality of uh, experience on the platform improves over time. But not all reputation systems are built in the same way. There are some platforms which have what I think of as a punishing reputation system which means that the primary goal of the reputation system is not to reward the good workers, it is to punish the bad workers. Again, I make the differentiation between Airbnb and Uber over here. Think of Airbnb, the more ratings you get, the higher you show in search results. As a result, you can increase your pricing, and if you get even better ratings in the future, you keep showing higher up in search results. So the rating system, the reputation system, is helping you increase your earnability in the future. Whereas in the case of a platform like Uber or food delivery platforms, again, repeatedly with commoditized platforms, there is no incentive for the platform to increase rewards for the worker. And so the reputation system is used to increasingly punish the worker, find the workers who are not good enough, and push them out of the system. When we see a reputation system working in this way, this is again something that is not really working purely as an intermediary from the perspective that it is using the reputation system not to enable free agency, but to control the workers. So another thing to look out for is the structure of the reputation system. Is it a punishing one or the rewarding one? Related to that is the fact that most platforms are concerned with failure avoidance when they initially start. They, are, they want to ensure that there are no bad experiences on the platform. They do not so much want to ensure that workers keep growing in the platform in the beginning. So every platform, when it starts, its first issue is how can I ensure that there are no bad experiences on the platform? This again leads to the idea of punishment taking over rewarding. And so uh, this is one of the things that we need to think about as regulators. Is there some way where we can solve this for the platform in a way that they can start investing in more rewarding reputation systems? I'll come back to that towards the end when I share a few thoughts around what this could mean for regulators. But this failure avoidance is one of the reasons why platforms start focusing on a punishing reputation system. Another issue that exists over uh, with platforms is that as a worker, I get logged in because my reputation is not portable. So if I invest a lot of work in a particular platform and I gain a, gain a certain kind of reputation over there, when I move to another platform, I have to start from scratch. Now this works very well for the platform, but it does not work well for the worker because the worker gets logged into one particular platform. And this combination of lack of reputation portability combined with a punishing reputation system can be very detrimental to the worker. Again, going back to the question of, is the platform enabling free agency, or is the platform trying to control the worker? So those are the ideas around reputation systems and how a reputation system is central to thinking about a platform as an intermediary or as an employer. What these things lead us to is that very often platforms end up creating inequality even in platforms that are, that where the work that is being exchanged is differentiated. 
The reason this happens is because a reputation system encourages the best users to be shown to the market repeatedly. So what's important is that as a platform, a platform should be focused in ensuring that every worker has equal access to the market eventually and that a few workers do not keep getting more than more exposure on the platform. There is a feedback loop where the rich keep getting richer because the higher the reputation is, the more you see exposure to the market. So the point here being that while punishing reputation systems are bad, even rewarding reputation systems, if they are not architected well, can lead to increasing worker inequality. And that's again something that platforms need to be careful about when they are uh, building for workers. The other issue that platforms have very often is that, as I mentioned in the beginning, the platform's governance and ownership is centralized and the platform's uh, production is decentralized. And this works very conveniently for the platform because the rewards all get centralized and the risk is radiated to the workers. This gets even worse when the platform with a strong legal department understands all the legal loopholes, but the workers do not. And very often they get penalized for this because there is no, uh, they do not have uh, the ability to, fi to fight their way out of it the way the platform does. And so repeatedly we see this pattern happening where once a platform gains network effects, gains dominance, the risks keep getting radiated more to the nodes because the workers are highly replaceable and they can take care of their own legal hassles while the platform keeps running out of it through uh, exploiting some form of loophole. The other issue that also happens uh, to round this off is that some platforms are actually, actually make the argument that they're empowering the workers, but it's not very clear whether the platform is, is uh, operating at market price or not. And that is because a lot of these platforms are funded initially by venture capital, because of which they may be subsidizing the, the price for the consumer. Uh, they, they, or they may be, incre they may be uh, sub subsidizing what the worker can get out of the consumer price. Over time, when they have to make it sustainable, when they have to make it work at market clearing prices, the platform might again change the cut that they take from the transaction. So it's important also to understand, is the platform's uh, economics actually working at market clearing prices or is it likely to change in the future? Do workers find it useful today and will workers be stuck in or tied into the platform in the future when the pricing changes. And as I mentioned earlier, frequent policy changes also create heartburn because workers, first of all, do not understand these changes happening from time to time and they commit to the platform and then they realize that the policy has changed again. So if we think about all of this, um, we come back to the fact that we need to think about um, how can regulators take action in this kind of a scenario? How can regulators think about the mechanics of the platform and what they could do in this scenario? The overarching uh, umbrella point that I have over here is the fact that as regulators, it is important to think about whether the platform is empowering the worker or exploiting the worker because that is the single biggest difference that comes in from the point of uh, being an employer or being just an intermediary. If a platform is just an intermediary, it should also be providing an infrastructure on which a worker can exhibit free agency. This is not just a mechanism for connecting the market to the worker. A true platform should be providing the mechanism by which a worker can express free agency, control the terms of exchange, and keep improving the ability to earn a living on the platform. If instead the platform is exploiting the worker using soft control, as we uh, saw over here, then the platform is more likely to exhibit the behavior of an employer rather than an intermediary. So as a regulator, the, the holistic or the systemic uh, goal of a regulator is not just to ensure that the taxes are being paid, but also that to ensure that the workers are being uh, uh, empowered. And so these two things work uh, hand in hand. If, if a platform has to avoid regulation by being an intermediary, then there should be a framework that the regulator can impose, which suggests that if you do the following things, you're not an intermediary anymore. You are very much a soft controlling hierarchical employer. And if you do not do these things, then you can go, about, uh, go around it because you are empowering the workers, you are benefiting the economy. And, and so this is where a few regulatory solutions become important. The first thing that uh, regulators need to be aware of is to ensure that regulation does not come in the way of 
platform innovation. It should help to provide fairness to the worker. It should help to empower the worker, but not at the cost of platform innovation. Uh, this, is the kind, this is the challenge that exists today because a lot of uh, regulatory efforts do not take into consideration the business model and the workings of the platform, what works for the platform, what does not work for the platform. And so for, 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 the, for the platform and the regulator to coexist and find a, 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 a mutually uh, beneficial solution, it's important to understand what are the kinds of uh, uh, what are the kinds of regulations that can be put in place that do not inhibit innovation on the platform? One of these things is that not all algorithms are created the same way. If a regulator, for example, requires that all algorithms should be transparent, it's not possible for, for example, a deep learning algorithm to be completely trans transparent. And yet a deep learning al algorithm e is not even transparent to its own creator. And it may not be doing something that is uh, inherently malevolent. So it's important to differentiate between algorithms which can be regulated versus algorithms that cannot be regulated and try and regulate only those algorithms which can be regulated and where you can trace back the rules uh, based on which policies are being implemented on the platform. So not having a single umbrella view of regulating algorithms is important. A second thing that's important is that um, we talked about the fact that reputation is not portable. And uh, when, when you, you do not have portable reputation, the problem that comes up is that every platform has to start with avoiding failure in its initial days. What that means is that if, if, a, if, an, if Uber exists in a particular city and a competitor comes in in the same city as well, it has to again sign up drivers, again start gathering data about them, and initially just focus on failure avoidance. If instead there was a way by which regulators and platforms could work together so that regulators could provide a common reputation layer across platforms, which would only help to initially identify the not so good actors and which would take inputs from all the different platforms, then that could encourage platforms to use this to solve their failure avoidance issue and then create reputation systems that were focused more on empowering the actors. Because the identification of poor actors could be done across platforms. This would also help in a, in a broader context because if you've not performed well on a particular platform, you often leave that platform, go to another platform, uh, and, and try to do the same thing over there. But having a common layer that identifies bad actors would actually help. From that perspective, the platform would then have much more incentive to not commodify the work but to empower workers because Every platform is able to identify bad actors in the same way, so the way a platform would differentiate would be by empowering the good actors. So again, this involves some form of collaboration between the platform and the regulator. If there was a way by which the regulator could create a common basic reputation across bad actors and empower the platform to then focus on rewarding the good actors, that would provide uh, a, a mutually beneficial solution for both. The final thing that's important over here um, is to ensure that we start creating favorable market structures for platforms through regulation as well. This might involve that if, uh, if we see a certain market where a particular kind of worker is heavily disadvantaged versus the consumer, we create appropriate protection for the worker in that market. So today, a lot of uh, worker protection happens across the board irrespective of the kind of work. And maybe we are at a point where we need to think about commodified work differently from differentiated work and create different kinds of protection for commodified work because the fact is, whether we, uh, when we enter the platform economy, commodified workers are going to be at a disadvantage. Differentiated workers are going to be at an advantage. <coughs> As we move into this economy, the platforms will win, the differentiated workers will win, but the vast majority of the economy is going to be commodified workers. And if regulatory protection of a spe specific kind is not provided to them, then it's going to be a much higher increase of what we see right now, where commodified workers are repeatedly suffering at the hands of the platform. So those are a few broad uh, uh, regulatory measures that 
might make sense from the perspective of how regulators could better understand the mechanics of a platform, of the market in which it's operating, and create regulations on the basis of that. What this involves heavily is a lot of cooperation between platforms and uh, regulators. This might involve some form of open data sharing between the two, some standardized policy standards of what kind of data should be shared, what kind should not be shared. As I mentioned uh, towards the beginning of this section, it's also important to ensure that innovation is not impeded because of our quest for fairness. So it's important to understand a platform's business model and understand what kind of data is critical to its competitive advantage, not go after regulating that data, but look at the other data that is uh, relevant for us to understand um, whether a worker is being empowered or not, or, or uh, whether the platform is working uh, in a controlling mechanism or not. So that's what I wanted to share overall. Thank you so much for listening, and I'm happy to take any questions that you may have on this topic. Thank you. Thank you.